Welcome to the herd and thanks for listening. If you enjoy this sodcast, please like it, share it, give it a good rating and follow, and help more people find their way into the Ruminati herd. If you have suggestions for improvements, please let me know. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Meet Your Herdmates Sodcast. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Jeff Goodwin. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Pleasure to be here, Peter. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you work for or with a Noble Research Institute. And where exactly are you located? We are located. Located in southern Oklahoma, uh, in, in Ardmore, and um, and we uh, we service uh, well. We do a lot of things. We we provide consultation to producers, uh, landowners, ranchers. We provide um, education and outreach, and we also do research. What are, th this is not the same noble as with the prize, right? This is noble, not Nobel. So. What's the roots of this um, organization? Sure. Yeah. We well, we started in 1945. It was uh, uh, started as the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation. Um, it was developed by a gentleman named Lloyd Noble, and 75 years ago, he had the the foresight to start an organization that um, really started with the soil to to help producers. Um, you know, he, he lived through the, 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 the era of the Dust Bowl and he saw what, uh, you know, the, the practices of the time had done to the, to the environment and to, um, to, to enterprises and ranches and farms across the Southern Great Plains. And, and he wanted to form a, a foundation to help producers to, to find solutions uh, in, in, in agriculture. And so... For about the past 75 years, we've been working with producers. We've been uh, trying to uh, provide outreach and help them meet their goals and, and their objectives on their farms and ranches. And, uh, and for the most part, uh, uh, also been focusing on providing them research solutions, um, answering, trying to answer the, you know, the questions that can help them make better decisions. Okay, but you're from... Northeastern Texas, is that mm -hmm. where your roots are? I am, I am, yeah, I was, uh, I grew up on a ranch in Northeast Texas and, um, and then moved around Texas for the most part, had a short stint in California, um, and then, uh, then came back home uh, and went to college, uh, bachelor's and master's at Tarleton State University in range science and then, uh, Worked for NRCS for a while, the, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, most recently uh, as the state range specialist uh, in Texas uh, for NRCS. Uh, in 2016, I decided to, to leave the agency and come to work for Noble. I really was, I really liked the direction that they were going, what they provided to producers. Um, NRCS is still a great organization, great partners. Uh, we work with them uh, still to this day uh, a lot. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I really liked the direction that Noble was bringing producers, focusing on grazing land. Um, and then I, I really like our focus now. Okay. Um, so you said rangeland science is, is your background. Mm -hmm. What What is that? What, what sorts of things does that cover? Well, rangeland uh, management is, is really focused on not only the the science behind rangelands. And rangelands are our are, are, are native plant communities. So it's community, plant communities made up of, of plants, uh, grasses, or gra think of a grassland or a prairie or a savanna. Those are typically rangelands. They're made up of native perennial and annual vegetation. And so there's, a, there's an entire discipline around understanding not only the science behind how those plant communities respond to management, but also there's an art and the art is really um, what is how those principles and practices are applied on the landscape. And that's what producers do every day. You know, they, they apply these principles and practice based on the best available science that they know. Okay. Now you've already mentioned this n new direction um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, Noble Research Institute is, 
embarking on. In, in a sense, uh, in a very real sense, it's new. In a very real sense, it's also a continuation of even the original desire uh, of the founder. So tell us what this direction now is. Well, sure. Uh, and and I, I would say that it's a focusing um, we are we are focusing on uh, a, pr- a priority for us is to help producers um, achieve regenerative land stewardship and grazing animal production with producer profitability. And so when you look at it with that context, um, it, it's really focusing on regenerating the landscape, um, working with producers to help them answer the, the questions that they're they're asking every day. How do I make my property better? How do I regenerate my soils? Um, you know, I think if you if you step back and look at the country, not even just the Southern Great Plains, but a lot of the our grazing lands, um, some instances have have seen some some regeneration, but a lot of them are have been degraded over time, and that's you know it's 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 because of a lot of issues. It's not just uh, um, you know, management, it's, it's just land use change too in, in certain instances. And so really when we, we step back, we want to help our producers uh, regenerate their landscapes, their plant communities, their livelihoods in a profitable manner that, so that they can be sustain, sustainable in the future and, and, and be there for the next generation. Yeah, it's it's interesting when you can step back and look at the history of agriculture and what's been discovered um, and lay that onto those land use change patterns that you describe and how that's been influenced indeed by policy at times. So, for example, preceding the Dust Bowl, there was the government inducement to become a wheat exporting nation. And so people were encouraged to do things that ended up in very short order, creating this catastrophe in the part of the country that you live in now. Um, And if you look on the East Coast or the Southeastern US, you can see lands that have been in agriculture for a hundred years more than your part of the country. Um, And that was before we had fertilizers or a better understanding of soils. And so we had major erosion and we had depletion. And then people moved west because the soils were no longer productive in their part. So now we're faced with this attempt to not just preserve, but improve the soil resource yeah we i mean we kind of have termed that regeneration or regenerative management regenerating the life back into these soils we too often think of or you know we think of soils as a medium to grow crops or uh, you know, a lot of times people call it dirt it's it's certainly not it's a it's a living uh, environment with soil bacteria and and uh, and they have positive beneficial uh, relationships with plants and and it's they're symbiotic and so it is definitely an ecosystem and so reviving the biology and the and the the, the living properties within that soil really moves us uh, on a different plane, it puts us into a different situation where we're actually beginning to understand how all of these key pieces work together, and they're and they're really part of the whole system. It's not we we, we can't separate it, right? And and there are many things that people can hear in public and in popular media. The, the question comes back to like any area of advancing science, our knowledge is limited, especially, and in this area is no exception. We, we've, we've spent a lot of years studying soils, but some of these things are newer ways to look at something. And 
so what sorts of research do you or, or does um, the, the Noble Research Institute envisioning being focus areas in the next few years and then further down the road? Great question. You know, I think um, I, when I look at this opportunity and, and our, our movement into uh, or f our focus on regenerative grazing land management, our focus is going to be on providing solutions for producers. So overarching, right, as, as we look at sort of maybe some priority areas for us, um, we're going to do this within the context of providing solutions for producers. Um, and so the, there, there's really sort of five areas that we really want to begin to focus on uh, as an organization. And first is this idea of, I call it the three M's, it's metrics, management, and monitoring. So when we start thinking about uh, managing our landscapes, we, we can't really measure or manage what we aren't measuring, right? So we have to be able to know where we are in order to determine where we want to go. And so this idea of metrics management and monitoring is, is really about asking the questions, what are the right metrics to look at? Whether you're looking at uh, soil health or you're looking at um, your, your livestock enterprise, but more specifically from the land perspective, what, is, what are the metrics that we really need to look at? There's, there's metrics, um, there's, there's plant metrics, there's soil metrics, there's, there's a number of metrics out there. What are the ones that really matter? How are they influenced by the management that we apply to the landscape? And so as we apply management practices based on these principles, how do they influence the metrics? And then really, how do we monitor those at scales that are uh, relevant to producers? Now, if we look at small plots and then begin to extrapolate that out, is it always representative of the landscape? And so we, we have to look at new tools and, and opportunities to tie in things like remote sensing and, and uh, uh, you know, other techniques to be able to look at these at landscape type scales, or at least the ranch scale. Um, and so that's going to be a, a, a big one for us moving forward. Uh, the second would be really what does this transition look like from a conventional operation to a, 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 a regenerative one? You know, you know, there are questions around timing. How long does it take? to transition a, a conventional operation into a regenerative one. It, it's a journey, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's, there's no, there's really not a, a, uh, you know, a, a finish line that you're going to run through and say, Hey, I'm here. You know, there are some metrics that we want to build on, but how, what's the time? What are the economics? Um, what are the, the, what is the social dynamic look like to the producer? How does it benefit their quality of life? So those are all questions we're interested in. The third bucket is really focused around, um, we have a strong uh, pecan industry in, the, in, in this part of the country. So how do, how do we build in regenerative principles and management practices that can help regenerate those kind of operations? Maybe it's a silver pasture operation where we, uh, where we look at, and silver pasture is, if you're not familiar with the term is, or your listeners aren't familiar with the term, it's, it's using a, you know, a grazing animal um, production system within um, something that produces trees as well, whether that's an orchard or a, or a forest. Um, and then that the fourth is, is really looking at the livestock side. What, what, what kind of questions do we need to be able to answer for producers about livestock adaptability? You know, um, within a regenerative system, we often, we often start with uh, our primary grazer in this part of the world, the cow, and, and we have to, you know, focus on fitting the right cow to the right environment, not the environment to the cow. And so I think beyond just looking at the adaptability of that, of that, that cow, we should be asking ourselves, is the cow the right livestock, right? Bringing in this idea of multi-species grazing with small ruminants to, to not only stack enterprises for the producer, but, but also to uh, more aptly utilize that, that resource um, and use them as a tool to help manage the landscape. And then, uh, Lastly, really a, a focus around regenerative uh, techniques and principles around wildlife and biodiversity. Um, that, that's, a, that's a tremendous opportunity for us in the Southern Great Plains. 
uh, not only as a, a stacking enterprise for producers, but understanding sort of those key roles that those those animals play in uh, habitat development and uh, or as indicator species for rangeland health, like grassland birds, for instance. So I think there's a lot of opportunity around those kind of four or five core areas, that, and that, that's where we're going to focus moving forward. And and again, it's it's such a wide area that part of the challenge is understanding or, or looking for the linkages between some of these metrics and the other keys like profitability, like um, long-term viability of enterprises. Um, so I, I was just involved in a conversation where people are measuring things but the and then they're making leaps by my impression leaps uh, of the importance of what they're measuring based on some arguably poor associational evidence so it, it will be an ongoing challenge to assess these things in the situation of a commercial enterprise, um, that that it has to, what does it, what is the return on investment for doing some of these things? Uh, and part of the conversation about ecosystem services is we haven't yet achieved a society that's willing to compensate the, the land manager, the steward, the owner for these things that benefit society. So the only thing they can be compensated for at this point is things like the, the animal products that are produced. Um, and that could include wildlife in, in fee for hunting on private land. It could also include something like agro-tourism. Um, but some of the others, we haven't yet gotten to where society is willing to, to support those kinds of benefits. So maybe it would be important to run down some of those ecosystem services to make the case for why society maybe wants to, at some point, entertain that kind of an approach to, to land management. Yeah, I mean, you you said a word there that that strikes me, and and, and I I I like to uh, think of that word a lot when we when we think about how things connect. You said the word linkage, and and when we start to think about you know in science, a lot of times we try to have the sometimes we have somewhat of a reductionist approach, and we want to control for things and then measure X right, uh, or and, and interpret it for Y. And so I I think um, I think we have to look at the landscape a little differently, look at the system as a whole. Um, and, and when we do that, we begin to see how our influences or the management that we apply to landscapes, how, do, how does that affect soil organic matter or soil organic carbon? How does that influence a plant community? How does that plant community then um, provide habitat for a wildlife species or habitat for a, a livestock animal? Um, and then how do we most aptly utilize those as producers, as managers, um, to, to create an opportunity to have a business, which is a ranch. And so, you know, I think our focus there is, is largely uh, at, at the whole of the system. Now, along the way, as these producers are managing regeneratively, we're we're producing a number of ecosystem services that you mentioned that are that are certainly of benefit to uh, consumers, to uh, public, to urban uh, audiences, and I really like to to think about um, three primary ones, um, and, and there's certainly more than this, but everybody talks about carbon, soil carbon, or or, or CO two largely. Most people, uh, when they think of, they hear the word carbon they think of CO2 in the atmosphere, right? Um, they think of um, greenhouse gas emissions, they think of things of that nature. But when we step back and look at carbon on the planet, on planet Earth, 
where is it located? And so there's carbon in the atmosphere, there's carbon in the terrestrial vegetation, uh, the forest, the grasslands. There's also carbon in the soil. There's more carbon in the soil on the globe than in the terrestrial vegetation and the atmosphere combined. Most people don't know that that carbon uh, grasslands, specifically rangelands too, are a tremendous carbon sink. Um, so we can't, we have those systems have the ability to take uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere and convert it into soil organic carbon and sequester it in, in those soils. Um, we look at uh, rangeland landscapes, for instance, 50% of, of, the, of the global terrestrial surface of the earth is our rangelands. And they hold 20% of the, of the global soil organic carbon in those systems. So there's certainly, um, there's certainly an opportunity as we look at uh, mitigating uh, the effects of climate change. Um, agriculture certainly has an opportunity to play a positive role in that system. Um, and I would argue that it may be one of the only sectors uh, as we look at that, that pie chart that EPA often looks at, you know, with, with uh, transportation and industry and electricity. And, and then it's got agriculture over there at 10%. It's the only sector out there that can actually be a sink and, and mitigate its sources. So we have tremendous opportunity there from a soil carbon perspective. And, um, but but soil carbon is is it's often I would I like to say it's the elephant in the room. It's what we always talk about. But there's a host of other eco ecosystem services that are just as important. Things like water quality and water quantity. Um, the 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 beauty is that they're largely linked. And so as we build organic matter in the soil, um, organic matter is is about 58 percent soil organic carbon. And so as we build soil organic matter, we increase the soil's ability to hold water. We increase the soil's ability to infiltrate water. And so most of the raindrops that fall on the landscape, they fall, most of them probably fall on a farm or a ranch. And they either get infiltrated into the soil and, and then percolated into an aquifer, or they run off. And they run off into a stream or a river and end up silting something in downstream. And that's not what we want. We want to prevent that. So we keep the ground covered and, and a host of other things to, to try to mitigate that. But water quality and water quantity is certainly something, everybody wants a clean glass of water. And so um, if we can, you know, quantifying the benefits of this type of regenerative management on water quality and quantity is gonna be really important for us moving uh, into the future. And then lastly, I think uh, certainly biodiversity is, is one of the ecosystem services that regenerative type management can, can provide. Um, everybody, you know, most people appreciate the, our open spaces and wildlife habitat and, and uh, you know, creating, creating the habitat for these, uh, you know, some of these even imperiled species that are threatened or endangered. Um, we look at our grasslands of of the United States, for instance, some of the, you know, some of the grassland bird species are 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 uh, you know in trouble uh, because of changes in, in plant communities and habitats and uh, you know grazing practices and things of that nature. So uh, it's it's certainly a an opportunity for us there, and it's something that I think we can serve as a solution for. Yeah, I. It's important for people to understand that. Humans have an impact wherever they are, that food production systems have an impact wherever it's practiced, um, and that grassland-based livestock production systems have a fundamentally different impact than producing commodity crops, especially when those are being produced with any kind of conventional tillage. And I would even argue that the, the development of cover crop, no-till, and then reintegrating livestock into those systems 
is attempting to get back to a grazing based livestock system and and those sorts of impacts you you're still involved in more rapid rotation than you would see in a perennial grassland um and and that fundamentally We've been comparing them as if there's apples and apples, when in fact it's apples and oranges or apples and fish. Um, very different things. Uh, to your point about the 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 ten percent, it's it's remarkable to consider that even the EPA document that gives us ten percent puts agriculture, forestry, and land use, which is that ten percent wedge, at sequestering 12% of the total emissions. So already it's the only net negative source, sorry, it, but that's the way they talk, um, sector of the industries in the United States. So it's, it's underappreciated the positive impact it's already having, let alone what it could be. Um, what are what are some of the benefits? You 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 mentioned water holding capacity. You mentioned infiltration as benefits of increased soil organic carbon, which is another way of saying soil organic matter. Um, but in addition, there are things like the ability to hold nutrients in the soil for plant uptake, as well as the soil uh, microbiology. Um, because these organisms are going to be feeding on that soil organic matter. Um, what are some of these you, you've mentioned, I think you've mentioned, but you certainly mentioned before we got on air about six soil health building principles. So what what are those? Yeah, I'm... I'm glad you, you you touched on that. You know, when we when we think about um, these principles, we often get a question. You know, what do we know about regenerative agriculture? You know, I, I think um, I think we do know. I, I'll tell you what I do know, and I, I often use this quote. And I, I love it. I I do not know who to attribute it to, but it's this idea that the more we know, the more we know we don't. And um, and I I can tell you I, I've been doing this in this this field for two different organizations over ten years, and I ask more questions today than I ever did when I started. And so this 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 you know continually learning about these systems, it's, it's I love it. Um, but we do know that these principles um, that that we try to set for for building healthy soil, we know they work. And um, interestingly enough, when, uh, you know, these principles were sort of developed by producers, they were developed, they weren't born out of legislation or regulation by um, a federal organization. They were built out of producers that were uh, really um, wanting to do things differently, um, you know, and, and, and what they, they were cropland producers. And what they saw is that, look at this native rangeland system over here. It's, it's working. It has functional ecosystem processes. It has, you know, what are the core tenets of that functional native rangeland system that we could then mimic on a cropland system? And so, and so we sort of built that into, into six really uh, core tenets. And, and the first one is context. Um, you know, the application of, of the principles that I'll talk about um, all depend on the individual producers context. So what that means is, is um, you know, what may work for you and your operation may not necessarily work exactly the same for me. No two ranches are the same. Even if they're next door to each other, they likely have different soils. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, a producer in North Dakota is gonna be applying these principles probably a little bit differently than we are in Southern Oklahoma. So context matters, but the, the first and foremost and in, in, uh, uh, you know, of the next five is cover the soil. We have to keep the ground covered. Um, I often like to say that we can't build healthy soils if they're moving. They can't be <laughs> washing away. They can't be blowing away. 
they have to be still uh, and and covering that soil you know it, it helps for a number of reasons but it helps us build organic matter um, it, it helps us build uh, through through um, the decaying process of plants um, being broken down by soil microbes um, we, we're starting to learn that building organic matter is not just above ground decomposition it's it's decaying root matter uh, and and it's largely micro the microbes themselves um, creating a, a lot of this um, um, organic material in the soils or, or building into that that, that organic uh, pool um, also, keeping the ground covers is is a, a temperature mitigation uh, um, process for us. You know, if the soil is bare um, in the summertime in the Southern Great Plains, if it's 100 degrees, it could push 130, 140 degrees on the soil surface. And when we get to 140 degrees, we start to kill soil bacteria. We want our soil bacteria to be alive and active. You know, when you when you cook a hamburger, you cook it to 140 degrees for a reason. <laughs> we don't want bacteria in that, but we absolutely want a living, thriving system in our soils. So we keep it covered and keep it there. Uh, you know, the second is to minimize disturbance. In cropland systems, we're largely talking about tillage. Um, we don't want to till the soil because that helps release carbon. Um, microbes, uh, soil mycorrhizal fungi do not like tillage. They, they can't persist in that kind of a situation. And so moving into no-till systems in cropland, but on grazing lands, uh, grazing is a disturbance. So we try to minimize the negative impacts by managing the timing, intensity, frequency, and duration by managing the actual grazing management. That's how we minimize any of the, the unnatural uh, disturbances, if you will. Um, increasing plant diversity. This was a big one. Um, tell me where we find a monoculture in nature. We just, we really don't. Um, Mother Nature wants a diverse landscape and uh, increasing diversity in our systems, whether it be rangeland, pasture, cropland is always a good idea. We know that increased diversity uh, increases the, uh, helps us increase the, the, the microbiome diversity. We also uh, know that it helps us to increase production. Uh, it, it, at least it's been demonstrated in a number of systems to help us increase production. So we're not just talking about the plants, we're talking about diversity of our of our microbes in our soil, um, diversity of animals grazing as well, wildlife, all the diver all diversity uh, of, of all types. Um, the fifth one is keeping a live root in the ground as long as possible. We want that, we want that the carbon pump, the, the the plants to be as active in the soil as possible. These plants are exuding um, sugars and starches from the roots. That's what feeds the soil microbiology. And so we want to we want to keep that active as possible as active as possible for as long as we can. So we like we we like to see cool and warm season plants growing throughout the year to keep that live root in the ground as long as possible. And the last one is is properly integrating livestock. So if we're going to utilize livestock as a tool to help us manage that landscape, let's do it in an adaptive approach so that we um, can can uh, utilize the grazing in an adaptive way that's that's um, you know, provides us a level of flexibility. Um, it, 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 it allows us to use the livestock again as a tool to manage the land rather than always looking at it, the cow or the sheep or the goat as our end product. It's really the grass forage that's our product. Years ago, we tried to talk to people about becoming grass farmers. Mm -hmm. um, where the grass is the crop that you're producing and then you, because there's no grass futures or whatever, you, you have to convert that into a product that you can sell. And so you choose which animals, but then this key point about you're, you're managing these animals as a tool in addition to your conversion factory to to create the saleable product but it's the grass it's the legumes it's the browse it's the forbs that occur that grow on that land that is your crop yeah now i, I tend to agree you know and i, and I might just kind of add to that that the if if a producer manages for those those soil health principles 
they're largely land use agnostic, right? We can use those on rangeland, on pasture, on cropland. Um, and we know that if we if we tend to, to focus on those, um, focusing on diversity and keeping the ground cover and all the principles, we know that most of the, uh, it tends to have a positive outcome on, on the ecosystem processes, on the four ecosystem processes. And the ones we really look at are, are the water cycle. Um, we want to ask ourselves, are we building organic matter in that soil to help build soil aggregation? And as those soils begin to aggregate and their particles are begin to hold together, they hold more water. There's poor space between the aggregates. It means we increase infiltration, more water goes into the soil instead of running off. As, uh, and the second is the energy cycle. Um, are we, how efficient are our ranches at capturing the, sun, the, the energy from the sun and converting that into, uh, through the process of photosynthesis? Um, how, how efficient are we at doing that? Imagine an energy star rating for a ranch. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, so cycling soil carbon um, is part of that. This is carbon is produced uh, uh, as a, a product of photosynthesis. It's, it's the, it comes out in the sugars and the starches and the plant parts and everything is built of carbon. So cycling that is really important. The mineral cycle is also an important factor that we want to be interested in. You know, how, how, how fast are our plants uh, being utilized or breaking down? Are they, or are they just sitting there stagnant and oxidizing? Um, you know, um, there, there's a lot of different processes through the mineral cycle that's that's important. Are we using, or, or do we have lagoons in the system that have the ability to um, help the plant through a symbiotic relationship fix or get fix um, atmospheric nitrogen? Um, and then the last one is really this this area of community dynamics. You know, what what is the ecological succession of? Do we have the right kinds of plant communities? not just plants, but the actual plant communities that work in symbiosis together on the landscape. Um, I really feel like once we start managing in a, with a regenerative mindset and, and we make the decisions, make our management decisions based on those principles sort of in the, in the thought process of our daily management, the ecosystem processes tend to, to start to work better. And so, um, it's certainly all about context, how, how, how fast or at what scale they might work here in Southern Oklahoma might be very different in Wyoming, um, uh, where we've got you know, temperature gradients and, and, and uh, different pan evaporation rates and all these technical things, but context matters. Um, but typically, if we start to manage with this mindset, things start to work a little better. And Back to one of your earlier points, if we know the metrics we're striving toward and we can explain some tools to managers that they might choose to utilize, then it becomes, as you said, somewhat method agnostic. We're, draw, we're, we're becoming results driven rather than process driven. And we can break loose of the top-down policy-directed kind of approach, which we have abundant reason to be suspicious of. Um, one of the arguments that people frequently hear when they're contemplating animal livestock agriculture is this idea that Animal agriculture competes for ground that could be in commodity crop or vegetable production or what have you. And so you've already said something about the scale of rangeland um, when we look across agricultural lands across the globe, but also this integration that I, I try to make the point it's not either or is a false argument. There is no either or that there's no sustainable food systems without livestock that they're thoroughly integrated into our food systems. They may look very different in North America than they would look in Africa, for example, but they're there even if we're, thinking about feeding of byproduct feeds to livestock. Um, so 
one of the exciting things that I think I'm seeing in North America is this reintegration into the same systems on the ground of livestock coming back into what had become this sort of specialized crop production system. And so I imagine that that's, as, as you've mentioned, some of these key pillars of soil health and uh, regenerative agriculture practices, that's part of this as well. Yeah, I mean, integrating livestock properly is, is one of the, that's one of the core, core tenets or, or the core principles behind soil health. And, uh, you know, 100 years ago, we were doing a lot of these things. You know, and and then we, uh, you know, fertilizer was developed, and we had cheap the three Fs, right? Fertilizer, fuel, and and feed, and and you know, conventional agriculture tended to 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 move in one direction, and and we we tended to start looking at these inputs as as um, you know it, as a crutch to the system almost, and. Um, you know, I think I think there's been a movement the last 20 years to uh, move away from uh, the the larger inputs and and really focusing back on the biology, how and the ecology, understanding how we can use ecological principles, building soil health, and 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 put a production system back in place that produces um, very nutritious, wholesome food but also produces uh, an opportunity for a livestock grazing enterprise. And when we look at rangelands um, from a food perspective, we don't grow a lot on rangelands that we can eat, but we grow a lot of things that a cow can eat. And it's got this supernatural uh, ability to convert food that we can't eat into food that we can eat um, in, in the form of very nutritious beef. And so, um, or mutton or whatever uh, meat product. But uh, the, the point is most of those rangeland landscapes, not all, but most of them are marginal at best at producing any kind of a food crop for human consumption. And so, and, th and that, that negates the idea about biodiversity and wildlife habitat too. I mean, we've already talked about how beneficial these rangeland landscapes are at producing habitat for wildlife. And so if everything was a cropland field, where do the wildlife go? Yeah. And so um, it's an interesting argument, but I, I think we're moving in the right direction. Well, and just like you, some of this pushback against the language, marginal lands has a sort of technical meaning. There's nothing marginal about their value for exactly right. what you've talked about. Um, forage agriculture for years has been thought of as a marginal enterprise. You know, it's what you can't grow corn on, so it's the marginal ground. You put marginal inputs into it, you get a marginal return. What a surprise. Put corn up there and let's see how it goes. Um, and, and with all the interest, rightly so, on the pressure for deforestation, in many parts of the world, the grasslands have already been converted. Um, and, and so in some parts, in fact, if you would stand back and look at it, we've the, the conversion of grasslands into agricultural production is far greater than the, the forestry. Um, and, and over the last several years, forest has recovered in parts of North America and Europe relative to what it was a hundred and some odd years ago. So the, the grasslands themselves had this tremendous and yet underappreciated value. Um, and if we can argue about the value of the food that's for human consumption that's produced from grasslands, we might be able to better appreciate that. Again, in the context, um, we're driving, you know, so I, I don't know the time frame of the vision for the Noble Research Institute, but one of my event horizons is 2050. Um, I might make it that long. I don't think so, but you know, um, but young professionals such as yourself coming into or undergraduate students, certainly it's within their productive, their 
professional lifetime. 70 to 80 percent of humanity is going to live in urbanized areas by that time. So how do we make the case for the importance of these things to a public that's going to be, well, I could think of a few, but I'd be interested in your arguments for, for why this should be of interest and, in fact, a focus for resources and other inputs to foster this kind of learning and deployment. And I also want to say not merely in North America, but around the world, because we have these challenges. You know, I think it's an interesting concept. You know, you'd mentioned grasslands being imperiled, if you will. And you look at just right here, the, the Blackland Prairie um, uh, in, in southern Oklahoma and large parts of Texas, there's about 2% of it left that's untouched. Um, that's that's a small sliver <laughs> of what used to be. Um, but when we, you know, let's just say that, you know, the urban uh, areas got um, increased in population, which is going to happen. Um, at, but if, if everybody moved off of the land, I mean, um, I, I think we would be in huge trouble. <laughs> For one, um, uh, you know, when, when we look at uh, when we look at these these rangeland landscapes or grasslands or prairies or pick one, they're all dependent on some level of disturbance. And so, and so, uh, when we look at how a lot of these systems evolved, they evolved under periodic grazing. Um, especially the Great Plains of the United States, what we call the breadbasket or the, you know, the, the Great Plains through the center of the country. Um, most of those, especially the warm season prairies, evolved with grazing and fire, uh, periodic grazing and fire from bison. Um, our Native American indigenous people, they, they used fire for a number of different reasons, um, from, a, from, from everything from um, helping them in, in a hunting situation to warfare. And so uh, these, these systems evolved with grazing, they evolved with fire, and we see what uh, across the landscape, what happens when we disrupt that. When we remove fire from the landscape, we begin to have an increase in invasive woody species. When we, when we remove the periodicness of the grazing, we see overgrazing and, and reduced forage production and and increases in invasive species that aren't supposed to be there. And so um, I absolutely believe that, that, that we have to, you know, there's this idea of preservation, there's this idea of conservation and exploitation. And so preservation is we should just leave it alone and let nature run its course. Well, if we take those things off of the landscape, we see what happens. Plants get oxidized, they're not being utilized. We, it's not natural to it. Conservation, the wise use of those resources is really where we fit in the middle. We're certainly not gonna go to the exploitation side. We've seen what that can do. And so if we stay in the middle and, and conserve our natural resources and begin to regenerate those over time using smart principles and developing the science um, that helps producers make more app, better positions, uh, more, better decisions, um, and so that they can more aptly manage the landscapes that they steward. To me, that's the only answer. Uh, there's um, a research property farm uh, in Kansas, in the Flint Hills, and I forget the name. I'll try to look it up and put a link in the show notes. Um, but I was in Manhattan for um, a sustainable livestock conference. Um, and so they took us on a tour out there as, as, you know, part of the event. And one of the things that they said that I had never thought of was that part of the Flint Hills are these relatively impermeable layers at some depth in the soil profile that keeps water above where the grasses and forbs could get to it, but that when the woody species encroached, their roots were capable of penetrating down 
And as a result, they broke those layers and now you change the hydrology in that soil. And so some of the changes that can take place are, are nowhere near apparent when you just look at the landscape. But indeed, the use of fire goes from the Atlantic seaboard straightway across, certainly to the Rocky Mountains, um, pretty well documented um, for the reasons that you mentioned. And so it seems to me it would be better to use the animals as disturbance than use fire for any number of reasons, not the least of which is we now have people living in communities in these areas or even as their own farm and ranch properties. And we've seen what happens when these cataclysmic wildfires take off for a number of reasons. Well, I think um, there's a big difference between a wildfire and a prescribed fire. <laughs> and so uh, I, I don't want your listeners to think that that, that fire is a bad thing because, because um, you know, the wise use of that practice or that tool um, can, you know, is, is, it's in some senses part of the ecology of the system. And so when we talk about prescribed fire, it's no different than the doctor prescribing, a, a, you know, a medicine for a human. I mean, it, it has a dosage and a timing, and a, you know, and, and you, you have to, it, it has a specific per purpose and a specific prescription on how it's applied. And so it's no different than fire. We, we have environmental um, uh, aspects that we look at, uh, things like wind speed and temperature and, and humidity. And, and if we're not going to meet the target or the objective, then we don't do it. And so um, there's, there's positives, but, but we aren't talking about wildfires here. They're always bad. We don't, we don't yeah. want to be out of control. Yeah. Um, we, somebody gave the, you know, you could take a hammer and lay it on your desk or you could hit your desk with a hammer. It's the same tool, um, very different results. Um, and, and to complete the analogy of the medicine, getting up on my soapbox, um, mm -hmm. if, if we're using that to treat a symptom rather than an under, which we could also use that same analogy in a lot of agricultural practices, over the years that we're, we're, we're not asking why we have what we're seeing and maybe changing management as opposed to what could I use to change this as opposed to changing the management maybe that gave you that. Uh, so that gets back to your mindset paradigm shift um, that, that the Noble Research Institute has committed itself to doing research and working with producers to accelerate that. Now, you're in southern Oklahoma. What does Noble Research Institute see as the footprint of this effort? Great question. So, you know, historically, we've kind of focused on uh, a smaller uh, footprint, and then it went to the Southern Great Plains. Our, our uh, our focus now is, is we want to move to a, a nationally recognized organization that focuses on producer outcomes. Um, it, it's not going to happen overnight. We're, we're building, um, we're working towards uh, being able to provide solutions uh, to producers all over the country. If they're interested in uh, regenerative management, if they're interested in working on grazing lands, uh, and they're interested in making a profit, we're interested in working with them. And so, and so that's 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 been our, our that's our current focus, and uh, we're working towards those outcomes. I'll, I'll I'll put a plug in for international grasslands uh, somewhere down the road because we have historically served as a place for people to come to be trained and go home. Sometimes we send people there, plus or minus. We can always do it better. Um, and of course, in two years time, 2023, we'll be hosting the International Grasslands Congress. And the, the theme for that is grasslands for soil, animal and human health. Yeah. Um, so um, putting a bug out for people to put that on there. It's May of 2023. Um, and I, I, I really am working 
and hoping that that will be one of those points that people can look back and say that we heard a lot there. We took it back. We did things. Things started in that community and then spread. So um, clearly, I know no, people from Noble have been interested in, not more than interested, um, have have been part of the bid and the planning process for that event. So I, I would imagine that continuing. Um, always like to give people places that they can go for more information. Um, and, and again, people who are like, like you said, producers, that's one channel. And, but, there are obviously more people who are not in agriculture than are. And how do we get more people aware and involved and, and learn about what's going on? Yeah, uh, opportunities for uh, continual learning, uh, just getting a question answered or, or finding more information is, is always important. You know, you can certainly come to uh, look at us at our, our, our websites, noble.org. Um, uh, we can, we can, we're, we're in the business of trying to help producers make better decisions uh, focused on regenerative grazing land uh, animal production. And so um, that's certainly a source for uh, your listeners. Um, uh, USDA NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, has a has pretty much I think a, a, a county office in most counties in the country. Um, they uh, they have a relationship with local soil and water conservation districts, and, um, and and so they have the opportunity to provide a tremendous amount of information on on uh, regenerative management, soil health. Um, they can help you develop a conservation plan for your property. Um, uh, it's it's a tremendous organization, and they have uh, they have opportunities for potential funding through um, farm bill programs. Um, also, uh, you know, there's uh, the county extension offices. Several of those are, are starting to to look at this uh, area a lot harder. Uh, but there's also organizations like Understanding Ag that is a uh, that are private and uh, provide a tremendous amount of education. They provide private consultation. Um, it's a it's a it's a, a group of very knowledgeable uh, consultants and leaders there in the in the movement, and so uh, I would encourage the listeners to check out those sources. And, and again, I'll provide links to get people pointed in the right direction because mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of information that a lot of people are not aware of. Um, so. Um, I've, I've been hitting you with questions and I appreciate the guidance and the responses through this process. Um, offer my congratulations, um, in, in, uh, February of, of last year in San Antonio, there was an event that I was able to participate in and met individuals from the leadership of Noble and I've, we were talking about things that obviously got interrupted. I uh, look forward to picking some of those ideas back up now that it, it seems an appropriate time to have those conversations. Um, but it's only fair to uh, give you the opportunity to ask me any questions that you might have in mind. Well, uh, that's, that's a great point. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, the direction of of this regenerative movement? I, um, how, how do you? What are your thoughts on on the direction? Well, in in terms of the goals, I uh, how could you be against the goals? To a degree, I think that there have been people interested in those for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So the, the the twitch that I have is the what I've seen happen a couple times over the course of my career that a, a new label comes out. Okay, now that becomes the point of excitement. And then what tends to happen is new sorry, resources are allocated, but they're not new resources. And so they end up taking resources and reallocating them. 
And that then ends up being this, this process where I don't think we make the progress that we absolutely have to make. Um, I, I also have a bit of uh, concern about something becoming, and it could be anything, new name registered trademark or new name certified. And then the certification becomes the thing you chase rather than, again, the difference between results driven versus process driven. And, and as long as we're focusing on the results in the way that you've clearly outlined, uh, I'm all for it. Um, as if that matters. I mean, no, but um, um, uh, the addition that I have yet to, well, the point that I keep coming back to is ultimately we're feeding human beings and, and the burden of malnutrition in its broadest sense is unsustainable in our society. And I hear people talking about things that I don't think get us to the solution to that. In other, and so we could talk about that, but we're getting dangerously close to my soapbox. I, I think that the, the key thing is that our, uh, and it's, it's not merely in North America or affluent countries, it's a global phenomenon that I, I think there's abundant, high quality evidence that humanity has too little animal source food in its diet across low, middle and high income countries. And so then we get to the question of how are we going to produce more in a way that preserves and in fact enhances the environment in which it's produced and makes it available affordably to people who are, like I say, living in urban areas. Um, so those are some issues that I see very much in the future, and I want to make sure that they're part of the, the awareness of this other conversation. I, I, I tend to agree, especially on the labels. Uh, we're not interested in chasing necessarily a label. Uh, I know that consumers have label fatigue at times, and uh, we're, we're interested in outcomes for producers at the end of the day. And uh, that will drive our education, it will drive our consultation, and it will drive our research. It'll, do, it'll drive who we hire as an organization. And so um, we, are, we are solely focused on providing solutions for producers in this space and on their regenerative journey. And that's where we wanna be, that's where we wanna go, and that's where we're headed. Well, I wish you all the luck and great success in that. And, and if there's anything that I could do, I humbly offer my um, self to, to come alongside, to, to be some part of, or just to encourage you when, when the going gets a little rough. So um, good luck to you. Thank you for your time. Uh, and thank you for all the information you've shared with us today. Absolutely. It was uh, an honor to be a part of it. Thank you very much.